Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to give everyone just a couple seconds to uh, filter out through the waiting room. Um, I see people starting to come in right now. So we'll go ahead and get started in just a couple seconds. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Rachel Rizzo and I'm the Director of Programs at the Truman Center for National Policy and the Truman National Security Project. So excited to welcome you here today for this incredible event we have on a progressive transatlantic future, Voices from the Next Generation. Before I hand it over to Tyson Barker, who is the head of the Tech and Foreign Policy Program at DGAP, the German Council on Foreign Relations, um, I'll let everyone know that we are going to go for about an hour today and we'll leave time for Q&A at the end, but also during the conversation, please be thinking about your questions and um, we can weave those into the conversation. So if you look at the bottom of the Zoom link, uh, everyone has been doing Zoom for a year now, so I don't really probably have to explain this, but <laughs> look at the bottom of the Zoom link and you'll see the Q&A function and you can submit your questions through there and um, we'll see them and we can make them part of the conversation. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Tyson Barker to kick us off. Thanks. All right, thank you, Rachel. And hello, everybody. And thank you for joining us for this uh, talk on uh, transatlantic relations, looking at uh, kind of next generation perspectives. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, I, uh, I think all three of us, the four of us uh, in the end will are all kind of long-ish term hats. We've been working on this stuff for about a decade, but that still uh, constitutes next gen for, for the old continent and this old relationship. And uh, what we wanna do is talk about how to modernize it and make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, I wanna start by getting out some of the things that I've got on my, my head right now, uh, because today is in some ways the Ides of December in the tech transatlantic relationship. Uh, I don't know how much you guys are following this, but um, today the European Union announced two massive pieces of legislation in the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which are going to really fundamentally recast the way uh, big tech functions in Europe. And these are gonna be debated over the next coming years, but this is really looking at what it means to be a market dominant player uh, online and what it means to uh, uh, properly govern uh, information ecosystems. So big issues. The same day this has happened, uh, uh, Commission President von der Leyen had her first meeting with the College of Commissioners with NATO um, very first meeting EU NATO at the not just the, the president level or the section level, but the entire uh, top brass political to talk about three issues uh, that they see as really important to the NATO EU relationship, trying to latch that relationship more closely together. And those three issues were a cybersecurity, uh, climate change, and hybrid threats. Uh, and then I think it would be uh, remiss of me not to mention a final point in this kind of Ides of December context, which is the uh, solar winds uh, hack uh, that has really opened up uh, the level of vulnerability in the United States government uh, across many of our uh, crown jewels in the US private sector, but the repercussions of which are only starting to be felt in Europe because many of the revered European institutions from the European Parliament to NATO, uh, to the National Health Service in the UK, all use the same software. Uh, so we will see how much they have been compromised by our friends in Russia as well. Um, but these are, not, these are just some of the topics that we can talk about. We're gonna end up talking about a lot of things. Uh, but first I wanna talk about the DNA really of the transatlantic relationship and how that has changed, evolved, uh, and how it will continue to evolve under a Biden presidency. And to do that, we have three excellent speakers. Uh, the first is Laura Coupe, who is the counsel on the Committee for Homeland Security. Uh, she is also a former Obama administration political appointee. In fact, I think all four of us are former Obama administration political appointees. So this is a little transatlantic huddle. Uh, oh. Jeff is nodding. He was not a political appointee. He was, uh, I think, a uh, Council on Foreign Relations fellow at the State Department. But we all worked in the Obama administration. How's that? Um, Laura, just getting back to Laura's bio, uh, 
she, she is a self-proclaimed Afropean American. And I know she has ties to Germany and Luxembourg as I learned this summer and has been a guest on my German language podcast. So I know her German is very good and she's very good about talking US politics in German. So welcome, Laura. Uh, our second guest is uh, Jeff Mankoff. Oh, by the way, and Laura and Jeff are both the co-heads of the Transatlantic Working Group at Truman. So doing a great job leading, leading that group. Uh, Jeff Mankoff is a senior associate at CSIS. Uh, a distinguished research fellow at the National Defense University, and as mentioned, a former uh, seconded big brain in the Obama era State Department, and is kind of our guru on all things Russia. So anything when we go to the former Soviet space, I think that Jeff is going to give us the answers. And the final guest we have just joining us is Cindy Romero. Uh, Cindy is the Director of Communications at the International Budget Partnership. Uh, and she has worked for a new number of organizations dealing with reproductive rights, uh, Catholics for Choice, but was also a uh, Obama era political pointy at USAID working on uh, democracy uh, and uh, humanitarian issues. Uh, and prior to that had many jobs working on the transatlantic relationship at Freedom House and at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and I should mention is a, a, an alum of the Central European University, uh, formerly located in Budapest, formerly and in the future located in Budapest. So welcome to you, Cindy. Um, I wanna start with a quote from a letter that we all signed a year ago, the, the four of us, which was an open letter for progressive millennial Atlanticism. Uh, and the quote is this, even if a democratic president takes office in 2021, which now we know that that's not an if, but when, uh, the U.S.-European relationship will not simply rebound. Europeans and Americans, like citizens everywhere, see the U.S. and its role in the world differently today. For the transatlantic relationship to remain a global platform for freedom, social justice, and human dignity, it needs to reinvigorate the spirit of 1989. The first step is to acknowledge the blind spots in post-Cold War efforts to build a Euro-Atlantic community whole, free, and at peace. So let me start with that and, and take that as a question for Laura. What are the blind spots in our post-Cold War efforts to build that Euro-Atlantic whole, free, and at peace? Sure, so Tyson and Jeff and Cindy know this. So something that really bothers me about when it comes to talking about transatlantic relations is that no one's really talking about how much the demographics, especially of the United States and Western Europe specifically have changed. Jeff will touch on Eastern, the dy dynamics in, in Eastern Europe. So I'll, I'll let him talk about that. But as someone who was born in Germany to Congolese parents, so for example, my parents were born colonial subjects of the Belgian empire. And I think discourse around Europe's legacy of empire, even when you even talk about the term transatlantic, the first thing to, that comes to mind with people that look like me is the transatlantic slave trade. So I think even just talking about, in terms of talking about the transatlantic, not unless you think about it, you know, the post-war era, you know, or it's the, it's the Yalta conference, right? When, when uh, all the, when the US and Soviet Union basically developed a post-war order. I think people like, you know, my parents or my grandparents were not in that, yeah, they were, they were not in front of mine or people that really were part of the empire. So I think definitely reimagining what does the transatlantic mean to me is critical, especially as the United States moves to being a majority minority country and as the demographics of key allies like France and the UK are changing as well. I think not talking about that is, actually an Achilles heel. And I think the protests that happened both here in the US and the aftermath of George Floyd's killing and the protests we saw in major cities like Paris, Berlin, London, that didn't happen by accident. So I think those are dynamics that are definitely not talked about, especially when we're talking about Western Europe and the US. And I think especially as countries that tout democracy or stand for human rights, I think it's also important that the U.S. is more transparent about issues like racial inequality or, 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 or just in general, just 
issues impacting minority communities or, or different segments of society that needs to happen also at the transatlantic level because clearly those protests in, in Paris and Brussels and London didn't happen you know, out of happenstance. There are definitely shared challenges. And I think, especially as the demographics of our countries are changing and we're trying to you know, build cred credibility in places like in Africa about democracy, but then we don't treat our own citizens who a lot of them, some of them look like those on the continent. We, if we don't, you know, I would say espouse to those very constitutional uh, ideals that are in our respective institutions, then we fail. And I think in the greater context of thinking, especially in looking at what China is doing, especially on the African continent, if we don't, if we don't, I would say, live up to the ideals that we espouse to domestically, then we're not credible on a global stage. And I think those are some conversations that the US and its European allies have to talk about. Laura, before before we go to Jeff, because I know he's going to have something to say about the the other side of the coin on that. I mean, were you? It was striking to be here in Berlin and see twenty thousand people in the streets of Berlin uh, protesting in a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, how does that register? Are we just to assume that the United States and Europe are in a kind of similar political discourse? That, that is that we're kind of grafting together a kind of political community. Is that heartening for us? Um, and what differences did you see in the, the tone of the debate on both sides of the Atlantic? Yeah, I think, I think the good thing is that the topic became something that politicians on both sides of the Atlantic couldn't escape. But I think the, the reality to this is that, you know, American racism is different from French racism or British racism. There are similarities, especially, I think, especially when it comes to the Black experience of the communities in those respective countries. But a lot of that racism is very uh, unique to the culture and history of each country, but there are shared experiences like slavery and, um, and colonialism, for example. So I think the legacies of that are topics that definitely deserve more talking about. Americans are far more comfortable talking about it than say our German counterparts. I think in Germany, people are just coming to terms with the fact like with terminology like white privilege, that that is something that did not enter, I would say even you know German vocabulary till probably this year. And then France is in a totally other situation where they don't even. I mean, well, France is sim I mean, Germany is similar, but in terms of Germany and France, they don't even recognize race, and basically they see all citizens as being equal. But that doesn't manifest in the day to day or how they are protected by the law. The UK is, for example, much more comfortable talking about race. And for example, they actually have data on how many black people they have. And they're able to basically track uh, like health disparities from COVID as opposed to France and Germany. So there's definitely a, the level of maturity around talking about these topics varies depending on the country. But I do think having seen the protests in countries, in those countries has forced a conversation. And like in Belgium, for example, since I'm Congolese American, the king of Belgium apologized about, you know, their about Belgium's behavior in in the Congo. So I don't think that would have happened without the protests having started the United States. And so I think things like that are examples of that those conversations can happen and and that there's actually room for that. And, and obviously, one of the things you saw in Belgium and, and countries with deep colonial past was um, removal of statues glorifying the colonial past. Obviously, King Leopold II was one uh, target of much of the uh, critique and re reworking of history uh, in, in, in Belgium. Uh, Jeff, I mean, we've seen this politics of iconography also take place in Europe's, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, how do you think that region, Central and Eastern Europe, going to Russia uh, over Belarus, how do they relate to that experience that happened over the summer in the United States and Western Europe? Yeah, thanks, Tyson. And thanks to everybody who's, who's joining us this afternoon and, and to Truman for making this happen. Um, before I start, I need to throw out the disclaimer that even though um, I'm employed by the Department of Defense, my views are my own. They do not reflect the policy of National Defense University, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. Okay. Um, now to, to the question. So let me start with something that Laura mentioned, which is the Yalta Conference. 
a lot of you probably are familiar with this, maybe some of you aren't. This was the agreement uh, between the allied powers, uh, the US, the UK and the Soviet Union at the end of World War II. It effectively bifurcated Europe. Uh, it led to what eventually became the Iron Curtain. You had a Western Europe that was ultimately integrated into NATO, that became the European Union. You had an Eastern Europe that was under Soviet political and in some cases military domination, uh, most with communist governments. Over time, the historical experiences of those regions diverged. Now their history up to that point diverged as well. One of the big differences was that the Eastern European countries didn't have overseas empires. Um, they had, in many cases, internal empires within Europe, but that was a very different experience. The politics of difference was, was different. It didn't have the same racial element that you had with the, the Western European overseas empires. And so fast forward to the end of the Cold War, what happens is this Eastern Bloc collapses and the United States and its allies in Western Europe seek to integrate these countries east of the old Iron Curtain into the transatlantic community on the basis of institutions and historical experiences that were rooted in the West. And that included certain value propositions that included ideas about uh, liberalism, democracy, diversity, that in many ways were alien to the political cultures of those countries on the Eastern side of the Iron Curtain. And we assumed in the bright afterglow of 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall that these values were universal, that the people behind the Iron Curtain who had been oppressed by the Soviet Union and by communist governments would welcome with open arms, freedom, capitalism, democracy, diversity, uh, all of these things that were associated in our own minds with the West. Now, the actual history of the last three decades has proven to be a lot more complicated. Um, we heard about the Black Lives Matter protests that took place in London, in Paris, in Berlin. There weren't any Black Lives protests, Black Lives Matter protests in Warsaw, Budapest, Belgrade, much less Moscow. Um, and in part, that's because there's a huge demographic difference. Um, you don't have the post-colonial diasporas uh, in these countries that you do in Western Europe. In part, it's a result of the different historical experience of these countries that didn't go through um, this period of growing diversity in the, the 1960s, 1970s. Um, in part, it's the result of the overhang of, of the communist education system um, and the fact that because the economies of most of these countries are weaker uh, in the post-Cold War era, they've seen an outflow of population rather than an inflow. Uh, so if you go around and walk the streets in a place like Warsaw or Sofia um, or Kiev, the population is much more monochromatic, it's much less diverse uh, than it is in a place like Paris or Berlin. Um, and that has real political implications. Um, so too does the idea, which has become more and more prevalent in some of these countries, that this post-Cold War political order is something that was imposed from the outside, that it's almost a, a new form of colonialism perpetrated by the West on these countries that had just freed themselves from Soviet domination in 1989. And so as a result, you've had this populist backlash. Now, of course, we know populism has deep roots everywhere, including here in the United States, as we've seen with the, the outgoing Trump administration, but it's taken much deeper root in many of these Eastern European countries where you have weaker democratic traditions, weaker uh, institutions, um, and I think more discomfort around the idea of cultural, demographic, um, ideational, generational change. Uh, these are older societies, especially because of the outflow of younger people to the West looking for work. Um, there's a lot of resentment around the loss of status, around the loss of opportunity uh, in the post-1989 period. And there's concern about the speed of cultural change. Again, there's not a big um, immigrant community in most of these places. You know, you're starting to see it emerge in some of the bigger cities uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. But, you know, again, compared to a place like Berlin or Paris, it, it's, it's very small. And so when you're in these more monochromatic, monocultural places, you know, the idea that political order, political conversations should turn around questions of identity and responsibility for colonialism, 
genocide, slave trade. That's a very hard conversation to have with people who don't feel like this is part of their own historical experience. And so when we talk about the transatlantic community as a single community, I think there's often a tendency to think about Europe as Western Europe, or to assume that the Western European experience is applicable across um, the European part of the transatlantic world. When in fact, what a lot of people, probably most people who live in the old uh, Eastern Bloc countries that are now part or aspiring to be part of NATO and the European Union is very, very different. And so it's almost like, how do we have these conversations domestically with relatives, family members, colleagues from other parts of the country who have different historical experiences, have different outlooks. We want to still consider them part of the family. We have to find a way to integrate them into the political conversation and make them comfortable with the world and the societies around them as they're changing. But that's a very difficult conversation. And I think we still, in a lot of ways, struggle to have that conversation. You know, the fact that um, Central European University has been kicked out of Budapest is a good um, example of this problem, right? Um, the Orban government uh, saw CEU, which was supported by uh, Open Society, George Soros, as being an avatar of this kind of ideational cultural change um, that a lot of the Hungarian society opposed. Um, and with weak democratic institutions, you know, Orban was able to consolidate his hold on power, overrule um, the, the laws and the constitutional provisions guaranteeing uh, institutions like CEU the right to operate um, and push them out. And nevertheless, Hungary under Orban remains a full-fledged member of NATO and the EU. So what do we do, right? It's not that Orban has usurped power uh, in a military coup, he came to power on the back of the support of a pretty broad swath of the Hungarian population that has a different view, a different outlook on what the transatlantic world is, what it looks like, um, and what it should be. And this is without even touching on the question of Russia, which we can come back to later, but I think understands these differences and seeks to play on them for its own political gain. Um, but let's, let's save that for later. That's that's a great lead in to the conversation about the quality of democracy, perhaps on both sides of the Atlantic. And what I think is really interesting, what um, what both of you guys have said, is that there is, if you look at the kind of lived experience, both in the in the Black Lives Matter post George Floyd uh, summer, um, and and continuing on to today, and the experience uh, east of the Iron Curtain. A, and a feeling of being excluded and not having agency over your own political destiny. And to be able to tie those kind of experiences together might be helpful to, to connect them better to each other. Um, but I wanna go to uh, Cindy Romero, who is somebody who has worked in democracy and, and, um, and uh, in tough, tough countries uh, like Cuba, and others, uh, and has been watching the region, the Western Balkans, et cetera, for a while. I mean, what's your as assessment? Do you think now we're having, we're in a hinge moment in the United States. Do you think that the, 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 uh, the model of the United States still has resonance in those countries that you know uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe? And what do you think that the Biden administration needs to do to operationalize that? Thanks so much, Tyson. Um, and so, I think there's a few assumptions that we're going to need to check as we try to reset the transatlantic relationship moving forward. I think one of the things that I've been really struck by is there's a lot of nostalgia in the United States and in folks who are joining this new administration uh, that we're just gonna go back and that the message to Europe should be we're back. In fact, um, Samantha Powers right, just came out with an article stating that, and it really struck me that that's not enough. <laughs> and it struck me the uh, disconnect between that message um, that's being shopped around by a variety of, of uh, folks tasked by Biden to restore the relationship, and what I'm actually seeing the Europeans saying. Um, the European, I was actually just looking to find the, the exact quote, and I don't have it, but the European ambassador uh, the EU ambassador to the U.S. saying, um, you know, we're happy that you're back. We, you know us well, but in fact, our demographics, uh, our shifting demographics might mean that, you know, the relationship may not actually be an enduring one moving forward. And I thought that was really interesting. I, I don't want to misquote him, um, but what I heard was two things. 
a desire by the Europeans, um, you know, to, to restore the relationship but a slightly more transactional way and continue to move forward on a European project of European autonomy, um, hedging their bets. I think there's a lot of fear among the European public that despite Biden's win, we still have had a delayed, right, a delayed electoral outcome. We still had huge portions of our population that reaffirmed and that wanted a second Trump uh, term. And I think that means that Europeans will continue to hedge their bets. I'm not saying they're not going to re-engage with us, but they're going to hedge their bets. I think um, what's also interesting is this implicit assumption that because Americans, there may be fewer and fewer Americans whose heritage uh, ties back to Europe, that that somehow means that our relationship will be less enduring. And I, and I worry about that. I, I think, you know, I always think back to my time in Northern Ireland. I was, uh, I, I was privileged to have received a George J. Mitchell scholarship. And one of the key things that that scholarship was trying to do in that program, the US-Ireland Alliance, was to modernize the relationship between the US and Ireland so that it not be one where uh, that was incredibly reliant on Irish Americans. Um, forging those ties, but that we actually move to a relationship where people like me who have no ties to Ireland um, can have that one year experience and continue to advance the relationship for the rest of their lives and in their careers. And so I think, you know, my, I think there's, there's a few things that a few hidden assumptions that we need both um, the Biden administration, as well as uh, the European counterparts to really check themselves on um, and really modernize the relationship based on shared values and a shared value proposition that goes beyond blood ties. Um, and I think in order to do that, one of the key things for the Biden administration, and I see a desire to do this, I think the devil will be in the details of having coherence in the domestic front and the global front. So if you look at some of the transition team members, in fact, some of them have been dual hatted. I think of some of my former colleagues who are now dual hatted in the COVID response, both for the State Department team and HHS. Uh, I think similarly, we need to, uh, on, on diversity issues, ensure that we're being coherent in advancing um, racial and gender equity in this country uh, so that we can actually restore our credibility to preach to others about democratic values. I think, you know, I think there's an awareness of this, but I think it cannot be uh, overstated the importance of making sure that we are not tone deaf or um, hypocritical in preaching um, values that we that, that a lot of folks simply don't think Americans um, are, are are living up to any longer. I think you know, in terms of coherence and making sure that we have a value proposition that works across Europe, I sort of see two communities in Europe um, that uh, that that really need strong outreach and strong messaging, um, but also action. Um, about the, this value proposition of the transatlantic relationship. When you look at countries like Serbia, my daughter is Serbian, uh, you know, what is the value proposition to a country that simply isn't seeking uh, NATO enlargement and that looks at some of its neighbors and says, what has NATO done for them? What has NATO done for Montenegro in terms of promoting democratic values in a country that still has very high levels of corruption and unemployment? Um, so I think we really need to, um, you know, speak to the folks who feel like the European project isn't giving them a job, isn't um, changing their daily life, and really make sure that we're, um, you know, speaking to the value proposition there from an economic front. I think similarly, communities like immigrant communities across Europe um, that have been left behind and that are suffering the brunt and will continue to suffer the economic hardship of the austerity period that we'll have post COVID. Um, you know, really, we need to think uh, critically with a critical eye um, about how the transatlantic relationship in the European project um, actually advances and improves the daily lives of those people. Uh, I would just say we also can't forget the communities that have been systematically excluded in Europe's east, uh, you know, I, I would just challenge Jeff a little bit about these communities, about these societies being 
all of one culture, because if you look actually at most of Eastern Europe is multicultural, multilingual. Uh, I think of my time living in Hungary where people would close the door in Transylvania and at home they spoke Hungarian. Uh, you have Roma communities that are still feeling very much left behind and feeling as if the European integration um, actually gave uh, a lot of countries were let in without actually meeting and or actually achieving any tangible difference in the lives of Roma communities. So I think we have a number of demographics that we really need to speak to uh, about the value proposition and really bring action, actionable change to their lives and, and, and not be Pollyannish about the lack of political will and popular buy-in that we have for the European project. Uh, that is a, a really good critique and a good starting point to talk about how what a, a Biden administration could do to kind of, I don't want to say pick up the pieces, but uh, really uh, recast this relationship and create a new organizing principle. So Laura, let me let me turn to you. I mean, Cindy basically said, you know, NATO and EU enlargement has brought some sobering results. And uh, there has been uh, the the poll, while it still might be there, might not have the romantic resonance that it had in the past. And in some cases, it didn't deliver uh, even the kind of nuts and bolts promises as in Montenegro, where you don't have a kind of steady, uh, you know, uh, attempt to uh, create a clean anti-corrupt or non-corrupt government, and it's not delivering the jobs on the ground. What could be in 2021 the organizing principle for this transatlantic relationship and how does that need to manifest itself in the institutions that we have? NATO, the US-EU relationship, the UN, the OSCE, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we could sh do is incorporate new topics because Tyson, you talked about actually new legislation that the EU commission is has rolled out on the legislative front. So in terms of on topics like cybersecurity, climate change, I think those are topics that NATO could definitely incorporate as well. Um, and I think even, or even confronting NATO members in particular on, on them not adhering to human rights and actually being very upfront about it. So talking to Turkey or Hungary about their failings and, and being real about it, because I think we're very, I mean, I think the Western countries are very frank when they talk to countries in the global south, for example, why can't you talk that frank to say leadership in a country like Hungary? I think um, Cindy ma made a good point too around, uh, I think talking about, especially talking about the demographic changes, I think, and having a discussion about coordinating our domestic and foreign policy. So I think even on the racial justice issue, for example, the EU commission, because of lobbying and advocating from uh, millennials from communities of color in Europe. So basically EU commission was formed, was forced in my opinion, but I think rightly forced to come up with the EU commission uh, plan on racism. And that's something that would not have happened again without the protests that first started with jo George Floyd. And so for example, uh, President-elect Biden said that racial equity will definitely be something that he'll be pursuing domestically. So this is something that would be unprecedented in the transatlantic context to actually talk about it through a transatlantic channel. And the fact that the EU commission has actually convened uh, a commission or, or has a plan about talking about racism, I think that is a great opportunity to figure out who in the Biden administration could engage with the EU commission on this very topic. And, and again, also Cindy made a lot of great, great, great points. But I think also it's shared experiences like racism, for example, are is something that bonds communities of color on both sides of the Atlantic. So why not actually talk about those shared challenges as well? And so I think providing platforms and mechanisms on such topics, I think would be great. I think during the Trump years, we saw great, I would say cooperation, especially at the subnational level on topics like climate change. I think I think fora like that could be uh, could be formed on other topics like on gender equity or 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 um, on or on homophobia or 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 just any any anti migrant sentiment. I think having fora like that and having that push to I would say the the high level meeting. So I think not putting it maybe you know at the bottom of the agenda during you know when the deputy assistant secretaries meet 
I would say have meetings like that at the presidential level, you know, have, so I think it highlights the seriousness of these topics and not maybe pushing it on the secretary of state. I think having conversation, having topics like that on the big agenda items, like during the next US EU summit or the next NATO summit, I think highlights the seriousness. And I think that would provide a, I would say easy, a, a big slam dunk to do that at the beginning and do it at the high level. And I think it signals to especially younger people and next gen folks that this is a topic that folks actually want to explore. We, we are starting to get some written questions from the audience and I want everybody to be able to participate. We got a perfect size group for everybody to jump in with questions or comments. Best way to do so I would say is to raise your blue hand and actually ask your question yourself. Um, but if you, the second best is to write your question. And we have a question for you, Laura. I'm just going to read it out loud. This is with regard to your first um, intervention. Uh, it says, I was really interested in your comments about the UK being willing to discuss race and holding data on this and was surprised uh, other countries don't have this. Does this data seem like a fair starting point to establish that diverse, diversity is being reasonably met? Great. I think another big reason why countries like France or Germany don't collect data, it stems from the history from, from, from the Holocaust and um, having, and so basically even, even it gets even more controversial about race being a construct and things like that, but basically that they don't want the government to misuse data and then, and target people based on race. The UK has a different history when it even comes to immigration and migration. Um, and, and I would also say they are a lot more comfortable. To, well, it's always comp complicated when talking about the legacy of empire, but the UK has a much more, I would say, longstanding history of migration, a lot of it coming in the immediate post-war period. So the UK recruited folks from the Caribbean and uh, from South Asia to basically help rebuild the UK after it was destroyed in World War II and the French did similarly in, in other countries as well. And so, and, and I also wonder if like the common law history has something to do with it, but the UK just has a lot more, it is a lot more comfortable. And so that category, so in terms of how they identify black, black and minority folks is the BAME uh, name. So it's for black, uh, black, Asian, and then minority ethnics. And so at least they have that data. And, and so for example, the where that data has been very important has been looking at um, COVID uh, mortality rates. So in the UK, because they have been able to collect data on, on race and ethnicity, it was found that black and Asian and Asian usually means, mainly means more so South Asian in the, in the British context died much higher than, than white Brits, or they have also more data to highlight that young black men are more are very are overrepresented in the criminal justice system and that is data that France and Germany doesn't have so actually in Germany black activists are pushing to the German government to start collecting that data because they don't know for example um, if more folks of color have died from COVID so I think having that information helps I think the biggest thing though is like what does the government do with that information um, but, and it's kind, it, it kind of stinks if you think about it, but at least activists of color in the UK at least have data to fall back on, whereas in France or, uh, or Germany or, or other countries for that matter who have a similar mindset when it comes to, uh, you know, collecting data on race or even recognizing race, that, that they don't have that. So I think the UK is better positioned because they have that information. But I think just like I had mentioned earlier, I think there a lot of European, especially Western European countries, are start are just now starting to have really uncomfortable conversations about race and the legacy of empire and slavery. Whereas in the United States, that discussion is not as taboo. Uh, Jeff, um, I want to kind of test a theory on you. So we have this new administration coming in. And they are kind of riding in and they have a critique of the Trump years. And it's kind of a liberal international critique that the US really tore the guts out of the alliance system and you know, really put everything under the question, JCPOA, INF, Paris, the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, TTIP, TPP, uh, open skies, every, everything under the sun, you know the list. And we're coming back and we're going to restore faith in this alliance system. And that's, that's our message and that's our critique, our corrective. 
Um, there's another critique uh, also voiced in the primary process and also voiced in Washington, a more progressive pr critique that says that there's kind of a, a globalist or a global, I won't use the word globalist, a global cast of kind of nationalist oligarchs who at once instrumentalize and transcend the framework of the great power competition. They like to use the terms of great power competition um, to pit uh, countries against each other sometimes, but sometimes it takes on a kind of vaguely ethno-nationalist uh, tinge to it and is, is used to distract sometimes from um, discretions that are actually being done at home. And this kind of transnational oligarchic class, be it in the United States or Hungary or Russia or China, uh, actually share a lot more in common <laughs> than the uh, citizens that they are supposedly serving. Uh, do you think that this administration coming in is has an approach to this? Do you share that kind of diagnosis? And what do you think we should expect? Ooh, that's a, a big question. Um, so I, I think this idea of a kind of transnational oligarchic class is actually, um, there's something to be said for that, right? Um, you know, I think there are certainly some of these nationalist activists in the United States and elsewhere who genuinely believe in what they say. Um, I think where they get their motivation, where they get their financial backing, where they get their um, political, where their political power is mostly concentrated is really around um, economic issues, right? It, it, it's about preserving a particular way of doing business and mobilizing this kind of resentment on the part of people who do feel, as you said, that they lack agency um, around preserving existing structures rather than transforming them and creating uh, something different. So there is this sort of unholy alliance between, if you will, transnational oligarchy and ethno-nationalist uh, resentment in the United States and abroad. Um, I think one of the challenges that this administration is going to face and any administration right now would face is how do you use the tools that you have um, to deal with this challenge which is not the challenge that they were originally designed for right we didn't create nato to deal with the threat of transnational oligarchy supporting right-wing populism right we created nato to deal with the expansion of soviet power in europe um, but NATO is what we've got, right? It, it's much easier to figure out how can we work through the institutions that we have rather than reinventing the wheel um, in order to deal with some of these problems. Um, I think, you know, one of the areas where there needs to be a lot of emphasis is on fighting transnational corruption. Um, the recent um, provision in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act here to ban anonymous shell companies, I think it's a, a really important step. Um, it's one that we could, I think, use as a basis to coordinate with um, some of our European partners. Now, you know, the UK is one of the, the big challenges here, and since they're going to be out of the EU, this, is, this will be a particular challenge. Um, but promoting financial transparency, you know, using the fact that the United States and the dollar dominate the global financial system as a way to demand transparency around financial flows, um, I think is a really important task that this administration needs to deal with. And they need to deal with it and make the case for why it's important to deal with on the basis both of um, this countering this ethno-nationalism, but also on sort of populist economic grounds. And I think that's one of the challenges that this administration is, is kind of feeling its way around. Because um, there, you know, there is this fissure in the Democratic Party between sort of economic populism and um, cultural issues or issues around identity and how do you sort of reconcile the demands of different constituencies to address these challenges. And I think this is one of those issues where there's an intersection and that pursuing genuine economic populism, not the kind of you know, fake populism that, that somebody like Trump promoted, but something that actually does you know, clamp down on um, dark money flows um, that promotes greater state uh, insight uh, into and oversight of uh, financial flows in a way that contributes to economic redistribution actually can ameliorate some of this 
populist backlash that gets expressed in a sort of ethno-nationalist way. Um, this is kind of a New Deal vision for how um, the Biden administration or, or you know, any American uh, Democratic administration should operate, right? I, I think it's, it's how do you figure out how to align the interests of those people who, as Tyson, you very rightly pointed out, feel they don't have agency, whether that's because of their class identity or their you know, position in the economic hierarchy or because of who they are um, in ethnic, racial, or cultural terms. Um, so that you're not having those two groups clash, which I think is what the Trump administration tried to do. They tried to really emphasize the, you know, the cultural grievance among white working class people in order to get them to focus on, you know, this ethnic, racial other, rather than to talk about redistribution, um, which is something that the, you know, the, the, the Trumpists and the, and the people around them didn't want to talk about. And in a lot of ways, they were successful. So this is also kind of a strategy for how do you regain the support of what in the US we would call the white working class for the Democratic Party for, you know, a kind of progressive vision for what the future looks like. And I think that's something that is not confined to the United States. I think that's part of the challenge that the, the transatlantic space writ large um, has to deal with. And, and one way to do it is to really put this issue of corruption, um, clamping down on illicit financial flows, um, taxation, redistribution, you know, sort of front and center and looking at it also as a security issue. Um, I know Cindy, Cindy wants to come in on this. I'm going to add a question on top of what, uh, what Jeff said, which is what he articulated was a, a much greater awareness of the geoeconomic instruments that we have in the toolbox using our, uh, you know, the interdependence or the dependence on us for certain assets like uh, uh, dollar denominated assets or uh, uh, ICANN or uh, general data flows or, or other tools um, to advance our geopolitical interests, um, which has been actually quite um, um, acknowledged and used by the current administration <laughs> and has elicited responses, not just from our adversaries, but also from our allies in the form of Europe's pursuit of strategic autonomy and digital sovereignty, for example, when they try to set up an independent cloud and independent uh, semiconductor industry and independent space industry. They're currently working on um, uh, establishing their own intersea cables for internet usage. How do we leverage that in the way that Jeff said to advance, I would say, progressive liberal interests without having it come and bite us in the butt? <laughs> was that, who was that a question to? Cindy, that's for Cindy, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to be humble in um, the reality is we will not be able, I think, to stop uh, the long term strategic interests that the Europeans see in pursuing European autonomy on a number of the fronts that you mentioned. I think we need to walk in with humility back into this relationship and acknowledge, uh, you know, our sins and our need for reform. And again, have coherence and domestic reform reflecting what we're pursuing jointly with the Europeans abroad. So for instance, and hearing Jeff, and then I've been really heartened to see um, Biden's transition team really prioritizing corruption and illicit money flows. Where I haven't seen a focus, and, I, and this might sound a little bit biased coming from um, the International Budget Partnership, we have been really interested in pursuing more domestic uh, corruption work. So how do you promote domestic tax equity reform? How do you address the fact that protests like the Yellow Jackets, we have a case study that's just coming out um, this week, so it's front and center on my mind about the, looking at the, the, the reasons for the yellow jacket protests. And yes, there's like a piece of it that's instrumentalist and that's got like this like ugly ethno-nationalist kind of like undertone of messaging. But in reality, people are really feeling that budgets aren't working for them, that the economy isn't working for them, um, that taxes privilege the wealthy. Uh, and so how do we address that together, but on the domestic front, how do we deepen domestic reform so that we pursue avenues for public participation in budgetary processes and budget planning 
things so that we promote and bolster domestic institutions. And part of our here in my current organization, because we're so focused on capacity building around this front and helping civil society engage governments, not in uh, exposing corruption, but in fixing it. What do you do about it? How do you get civil society working with audit institutions? to address, for instance, the corruption that we're seeing in COVID money flows that we just saw in the UK, the Boris uh, giving contracts to his lovers, right? Um, <laughs> how do you address that domestically? Uh, and so, because it really is leading to a lack of public trust in government and a breaking of the social contract both in our society and, 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 across, our, and across the Atlantic. And I think for a lot of people, it again, like gets to the core of why they feel that the European project isn't working for them, that it isn't leading to stronger domestic reform in like their daily lived lives in their country, in their municipal, with our European allies and share examples. There are many European countries that are doing, um, in Nordic countries that are doing a, a particularly good job of promoting public participation on the on budgetary processes, for instance. How do we promote greater civil society so that we, again, build a constituency that looks like today's America, that looks like today's Europe, that is advancing um, the European project and the values and the idea that we're together, not because we're, we're all from Europe, but we're together because we believe that open societies, open budgets, open government are transatlantic values that we need to pursue. And then how can we just be a little bit more muscular in the first year of this new administration um, to pursue executive action as much as possible on things that will send a clear message um, that we're going to lead on our values. So we've already heard some of the executive actions that will be taken on the climate change front. I would love to see more done on, um, on reproductive rights, getting rid of the Helms and Hyde Amendment would allow us to free up USA funding for reproductive rights. And that would really help the Europeans who end up carrying the brunt of funding projects that we're currently not funding to, to give women the full access to, to the services that they deserve. And would send a message that we respect our women, that we recognize this is a justice issue, um, and that we're going to be forward leaning, not just in putting women in power, but actually doing things that change women's everyday lives. And again, that restores this trust that the transatlantic relationship is one of mutual and shared value. We have uh, five minutes and I know we have a hard stop and we've got a great set of questions here. I'm gonna just go ahead and shoot these questions that you guys rapid fire uh, and take them up for maybe one minute and maybe also wrap in any final thoughts that you have. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Laura. Uh, we have a question from Sweden actually. Um, even if Biden won the election with over 74 million votes, uh, over 74 million uh, people voted for Trump. I know a lot of Europeans are thinking about the long-term effects of Trumpism and how the last four years have created mistrust in the long-term commitment of the US to global issues. I'm curious about all of your thoughts uh, on how the presence of Trumpism will affect the next generation transatlantic relationship. So Laura, how does the long-term look? Okay, well, in terms of the immediate effects of Trumpism, right now I'm actually in the suburbs of Detroit. I'm in Clarkston, Michigan. And my parents' neighbor has a Trump flag waving right next door. So in terms of the effects of Trumpism or understanding Trumpism, I think, especially I think communities of color that have experienced four years of Trump, it's we I think there I think people are just aware of the longer term forces that led to what people discuss as Trumpism. And I think Jeff highlighted a lot of that is is rooted in economic anxiety, plus also I would say some some ra racial underpinnings as well. So I think understanding kind of the United States, how it is, I think would should prepare America, uh, should prepare our European colleagues. I think Europeans have this very romanticized version of what America is. And I would say, I actually recommend to Europeans, sure, I think, especially I think a lot of Europeans have focused on Trump country or what that is. So. I recommend folks go to Trump country, but when you come to DC, come also to Southeast DC, see other parts of DC besides, um, you know, where the buildings are, but 
Also understand that like DC was historic, it is historically or has historically been in a black city too. I think Europeans really have to understand America for what it is and, and understanding all segments of that and also understanding our history more so that they can kind of meet their expectations. And then Tim Rivera had a question, so I'll, I'll loop that in. Um, in terms of talking about anti-racism on a US European level, I think the thing is it's a topic that people have not wanted to touch, let's be honest. Um, because it speaks to the failures of our democracies. And, and it's not just an American issue when it comes to police brutality. We're seeing that in France right now um, and how that it's manifesting in, in the way that the police conducts its uh, engagement with communities of color, um, Muslims uh, and, and, and immigrants, you know, spanning from the former empire. So I think there is a lack of, people are not comfortable with it, but I think the protests highlight that something has to be done. And so I think one thing, especially in the transatlantic realm, is for the folks that usually tend to be at the table to bring new voices in. I, something that I always talk about, especially when it comes to democracy work that I'm annoyed by, is that no one at transatlantic events invites the NAACP. Or I think Stacey Abrams would be great you know, for a next de su summit on democratic issues, right? But someone like Stacey Abrams has not been invited. And so I, I hope that with the new administration, people can understand that actually us putting people like Stacey Abrams, you know, bring her over to Europe more, especially at a high level, gives America actually more credibility because those are issues that are happening to communities of color in Europe. And also something I always tell folks too, something that I value having grown up in Europe as a person of color is that Black America to me is, I would say the beacon of democracy globally, that the, especially the commitment to civil rights and forcing America to really live up to its ideals is what has given America its credibility because there has been no civil rights equivalent, no civil rights movement equivalents in Europe. And so that's why a lot of Europeans, rec um, I would say revere America. So I would say bring more of, the, of those unsung heroes. And I think it'll make a lot of folks uncomfortable that tend to be at these meetings because they're they're not the experts on this issue. That was an excellent point. Thank you so much, Laura. I know you have to jump off. I'm going to ask if we can go about five minutes over so we can get some final words from from Jeff and Cindy. Uh, Jeff, I mean, everything that Laura just mentioned is is really important and it comes to this issue of new voices, agency, inclusiveness, and the role that that has in restoring legitimacy to democratic processes. Let me ask you, how do we do that in the US-Russia relationship? How do we uh, draw out these communities that have become disengaged and cynical about uh, participation in the political process in Russia? So you're talking about how should we engage the Russian population? Well, you know, look, I, I think we, it, it's a very tough, environment because the Russian government has made the operation of democracy promotion and even associated uh, media and NGO outlets very difficult. Um, and in part, I think it's because they see those as being agents of political change, which of course they are, um, and that this poses a threat to the survival of their particular form of government. And so you know, I, I don't think we can have the larger conversation around political interference, which you know, go back to 2016 and, and all the things that, that Russia may or may not have been involved in um, without talking about this piece of it as well. Um, my read on, on Russian activities in 2016 was the Kremlin saying, okay, you think you can interfere in our politics? Well, let us show you what that looks like and see how much you like it. So I think we have to be really careful um, around some of these issues. Um, I think being open to um, having to bringing more Russians to the United States, uh, particularly people from the younger generation who don't have memory of the Soviet Union, who have traveled more uh, or more worldly. Um, I think that is, is, is very important. And I think some of the efforts to restrict, you know, travel of foreign students, um, you know, immigration of, of highly skilled um, uh, workers, that the Trump administration pursued are enormously damaging, not only for the American economy, but also in terms of our ability to uh, engage with people in other countries, including Russia, um, who might, through their exposure to 
what is going on in the U.S. to the, the greater diversity and the, the greater ideological ferment that's going on in the United States brings some of these ideas and values back with them when they go home. Um, so I think we, we need to do more of that. Um, obviously, you know, fixing the mess that is now at Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, which is a whole other story. Um, so institutional reform at home in terms of the institutions that we use to reach out to people um, in places like Russia, I, I think is, is important. Um, and, you know, just sort of regular good old citizen diplomacy, right? Like getting people to travel, getting people to uh, participate in events, getting people to study abroad, um, sort of all of these things um, that, you know, we recognize during the Cold War as being an important way of reaching around restrictions that Moscow placed on uh, contact with ordinary Soviet citizens, but we figured out how to do it. And I think, you know, we can do that again today if we kind of get over some of our own wariness about one, engaging with Russians, and two, uh, opposition to letting people in the country because of some of these nativist concerns that, that we've been talking about. Um, I think that both of these are these are great ways to start to reset the, uh, the, the entire way we look at transatlantic relations. Uh, Cindy, you've mentioned a lot of things as well. Maybe just to wrap us up, Aside from the headlines, which we all know, we know the list, uh, coming back to Paris, coming back to the JCPOA, lifting 232, all this, this stuff, uh, restoring faith in, in NATO and, and taking away the sort of, sort of Democles over the EU, all this kind of stuff that, that the Biden administration will do. What is the thing that isn't on the list that should be for a first action with regard to Europe? That's a great question. Sorry, I have some background noise. <laughs> but, um, and, and I would say, you know, I think, like I said earlier, getting rid of Helms and Hyde. So being coherent again in removing restrictions to public funding um, for, uh, for abortion, both in, in this country as well as abroad, would just send a clear message that we're leading um, forcefully uh, on on uh, gender equity issues and gender justice issues, um, and I think we can't uh, understate how important those moral and democratic um, actions could be for restoring our moral leadership with European partners. I think they would be really um, surprised and relieved to see that, and it would relieve some of their funding concerns. Um, and then I would just second what uh, Jeff is saying. I don't think it's something we could do immediately, um, but we really, really need to strengthen ties, um, people to people ties, and making sure that those people to people ties reflect our new demographics and, and that we're getting, you know, a lot of times when I've seen these projects, they often um, recruit people who speak English, people who come from, um, capital cities, we're not reaching parts of Russia that are the forgotten the forgotten um, parts of Russia right across the, the 11 or so time zones. So how are we making sure that those um, that we're reaching those people and that we're bringing those folks to the United States? Um, I, I think that would that would make a, a very big difference. I would actually also say controversially, I don't know that we should be investing in English um, projects like uh, like Voice of America and countries where, um, you know, it's reaching a very narrow slice of society. I know that's a really controversial point and I've worked on independent media for a long time and that probably needs more fleshing out. But controversially, I would say we really need to rethink whether US funded independent media is the best way forward to get our message out there. It's always good to end on a controversial note because that gives us a chance to tee up our next conversation, which hopefully we will have in 2021 once the Biden administration is in. I want to thank uh, Jeff, Cindy, and of course, Laura, who had to jump onto a new call. Um, I work a lot with the German government right now on what we're calling, what we're thinking, this is not a term that the Germans would use, but their uh, digital grand strategy. And the way I always define it is, how do you link the capabilities and object objectives that you have domestically with the capabilities and objectives that you have internationally? And it sounds like 
That is the formula that the United States is looking for right now when thinking about how to engage Europe. Um, and I think this conversation was a great starting place. Uh, we did a little of a, a little bit of soul searching ourselves, and I think that that is is what we should do. That's appropriate. Uh, perhaps that comes a priori to talking about defense spending in NATO and trade deals and and the like. So thank you guys for such a good conversation and have a great Christmas and and holiday and stay safe and healthy.